Next, a House Operations Subcommittee hearing focusing on the Federal Aviation Administration's use of technological advances. Testifying before the subcommittee were FAA officials as well as administrators from private aviation industry and aviation associations. Representative Colin Peterson of Minnesota chairs this hearing. It runs about three hours. Subcommittee uh, will uh, be in order. <clears throat> This morning, uh, we'll examine how the Federal Aviation Administration could be costing the taxpayers and the aviation industry billions of dollars a year because of how it applies new technology, such as uh, what we're calling uh, free flight. The topic of today's hearing, uh, free flight, illustrates FAA's approach to new, ne new technology, an approach that is increasingly criticized. Air carriers claim they're losing about $3.5 billion annually from FAA's restrictions on free flight. Others put the price tag uh, much higher to almost $5.5 billion. Today's technologies open the door to huge improvements in aviation efficiency, capacity, and safety. And these improvements would also reduce costs for industry and taxpayers, could expand air service to small communities, and could boost the general economy. But FAA's delay in evaluating and placing new technology uh, in holds back progress and all the benefits that go with it. So when industry is ready uh, to implement new technology, it's uh, often held captive by the FAA's own bureaucracy and inefficiency. Basically, uh, free fl flight technology could free aircraft from excessive air traffic control. It could uh, give air carriers and pilots more flexibility in directing their aircraft. Broadly defined, uh, free flight technology lets pilots safely fly their preferred routes without being overmanaged by air traffic control. And free flight's effic new efficiencies could also increase uh, airspace and airport capacity. It differs uh, from the typical routes, routes that uh, air traffic control dictates to aircraft. And not only are these air traffic control routes less efficient, some say they are antiques or should be. Uh, the FAA says its national route pro program is free flight, but uh, I don't think that that's really accurate. Uh, FAA's national route program lets some aircraft fly their preferred, preferred routes sometimes, but they, still do are, they are still too controlled by air traffic uh, management and some argue that such extensive control is no longer necessary with the new technologies that we have available. Today, uh, some of the witnesses will argue that the FAA, uh, attempting to improve air traffic, is guaranteed failure if it relies on building upon the current air traffic control system. In their opinion, it's the current system that's the problem. It's so outdated that even if new technology is fully applied, it would only produce marginal benefits. They argue uh, with new technology and modern aircraft's capability, the current air traffic control system should be radically restructured. Our present system of air traffic control dates back to the late 50s and early 60s when air travel was very different than it is today. We had uh, piston-powered aircraft, not jets. And only a few people were flying, and only a small number of aircraft were flying at any one time. Moreover, at that time, uh, airports didn't have any capacity problems, hubs didn't exist, and airport parking was easy, but that's uh, all history. The FAA did well by us then. Uh, the system it crafted essentially, essentially still serves us today, providing undeniably safe air transportation uh, in, as, it, uh, as it always has. <coughs> But now it's argued that the FAA, by building on that system and not considering any other method, limits the improvements that are possible in safety, capacity, and efficiency. Other related issues will also be raised in this hearing. Uh, you will hear about FAA's reluctance to release certain information now available th uh, through new technology to pilots and air carriers. Uh, FAA collects all this valuable safety information, weather, uh, location of aircraft, etc but sends us only to the air traffic, control, uh, air traffic controllers. Yet uh, this new technology uh, could get this data to users too, and that, uh, some say, would increase safety. 
Uh, we are sacrificing safety and efficiency benefits by not sharing this information with users of the system, in uh, some people's opinion. Uh, but before we uh, start uh, today, I want to commend the FAA for breaking free from its institutional chains and showing that uh, once in a while it can be flexible. Uh, for example, the FAA has, uh, in my opinion, pushed the envelope on the global positioning system, uh, moving faster uh, and more efficiently than ever before and uh, to the surprise of a lot of people. And I want to commend them for that. Uh, it's already uh, issued uh, uh, several GPS approaches, which I've taken a look at and more are expected soon, and they're doing testing on uh, Category 2 and 3 landings, which I'm convinced are going to happen. It's just... Uh, I'm convinced it can be done. It's just a matter of uh, us proving it. And so uh, I'm very pleased uh, with the work they've done in that area and hope that uh, with this hearing maybe we can get some focus on some other areas. I'm also pleased uh, with the FAA's announced plans to uh, help to revitalize general aviation. There's a number of things that are under consideration, uh, and I would like the FAA to keep me informed on the progress of those initiatives and hope that they would move that along uh, uh, sooner rather than later because uh, I really think we have some tremendous opportunities in ge general aviation uh, and we're kind of at the bottom heading up and uh, hopefully we can all um, get behind and, and uh, move that area ahead. So uh, with this uh, new uh, FAA approach uh, since we've seen, uh, such as we've seen with GPS, uh, one that's more responsive to users' needs. Uh, I think that this could be a model or should be a model for the future FAA's efforts, and I hope that uh, it will be. We have uh, so many opportunities today, I think, with this new technology. If we can put it together, uh, we can really change the system to the benefits of the people that use it. And uh, I think the FAA now has a chance to develop an effective strategy to reap all these potential benefits, and uh, we hope that uh, they will do that. Uh, I would now uh, recognize the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, Mr. Zeloff, for uh, any opening statement that he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, appreciate your calling today's hearing. We'll have a chance to examine uh, FAA's implementation of new technology and specifically look at the free flight technology. Free flight, uh, as you've indicated, is very intriguing technology because it could potentially revolutionize the way that we manage air traffic. Instead of flying very set flight patterns uh, under the direction of FAA, FAA air traffic controllers, free flight technology will permit aircraft to fly the most direct and most efficient route between destinations. This new technology has the potential to increase airspace uh, capacity, boost air, airport capacity through more efficient use of runways, reduce delays, and provide billions of dollars in savings to air carriers. Obviously, consumers would benefit tremendously from lower airfares and the increased availability of flights. The Air, Tra the air Transport Association estimates that the major air carriers are losing about $3.5 billion every year because we do not fully utilize new air traffic management technologies such as free flight. Given the uncertain financial condition of the industry, this is a situation that we simply cannot allow to continue indefinitely. Of course, air safety must always be our primary consideration, and I'm aware that reservations do exist about moving too quickly with this technology. Our efforts to improve airspace capacity and efficiency should not in any way come at the expense of safety. I hope the FAA can now uh, update us on how they are progressing with the new air traffic control system. Our capacity to see the benefits of a free flight uh, routing system is dependent largely on the modernization of the air traffic control system. I find it disturbing that we continue to hear about long delays cost overruns and cancellation of systems, and this simply cannot continue. I had the pleasure of visiting the Boston uh, Center uh, Air Traffic Control Facility located in Nashua, New Hampshire last year. The center controls all air traffic in New England, down in New York, and for 150 miles out in the Atlantic Ocean. And I talked with people that manage the flow of air traffic on a day-to-day -day basis, and I was very impressed by the professionalism and the dedication. But I also saw firsthand the equipment that they use, which by anyone's standards is sadly out of date and in desperate need of modernization. It became readily apparent to me that the FAA must do everything possible to see that the modernization process is completed. I look forward to hearing the testimony from our witnesses and exploring these very, very important issues further. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zeloff. Uh, <clears throat> we are pleased today to have with us uh, 
Congressman Bill Klinger from Pennsylvania, the, who's the ranking minority member uh, of both the Government Operations Committee and the Committee on Public Works and Transportation uh, Subcommittee on Aviation. And most importantly, he's a pilot like I am, and uh, he has had an opportunity to uh, fly a GPS approach, uh, such as I have, and uh, we welcome his presence here and his continuing interest in aviation. Chairman, I thank you, and I want to commend you for holding this hearing. As you indicated, I, my other hat, I, I'm the ranking member on the Aviation Subcommittee, and uh, we wrestle with the problems of how we're going to deal over the next uh, decades with the exponential increase and in, uh, anticipated increase in air travel in this country. Uh, we took one step yesterday, I, I believe, in, in finally approving the uh, Airport Improvement Program uh, conference report, which will address some of the critical needs in some of our major airports uh, and hopefully increase capacity. Um, but this is a, a, an area that I think uh, this hearing is of very great interest because it does uh, look at some new technologies. As we know, as you've indicated, the FAA is charged with moving aircraft safely and efficiently through the skies. And with regard to safety, no one, I think, can argue that FAA has not done a, an outstanding job. Their record of guiding tens of millions of flights is unparalleled anywhere in the world. And with regard to efficiency, uh, FAA has managed this task well, although recent developments in navigation and communications technologies and changes in the manner in which air carriers deploy and schedule aircraft have led many in the industry to question the current regime of positive control and continued reliance on a defined system of airways. Under positive control, the air traffic controller directs all aircraft movements on the ground and in the air. A pilot flying an instrument flight plan cannot deviate from an assigned altitude or heading unless first receiving permission. And as uh, is indicated here, under free flight, a pilot would not necessarily rely on an air traffic controller for direction, except to the extent that the controller seeks to resolve potential conflicts. The current airway system relies on a huge network of VCR stations. It was and is, I think, a logical method to direct aircraft around the country. But the advent of modern navigation technologies, such as the GPS, and inertial navigation systems now permit aircraft to operate completely independent of ground-based uh, VCR stations. More importantly, these technologies allow aircraft to operate point to point instead of relying on the current maze of airways, saving both time and fuel, as has been alluded to by you, Mr. Chairman. While the term free flight suggests point to point service, the term embraces a series of technological and procedural changes that if we take them all together, fundamentally affect the current proven method of safely separating and guiding aircraft across the system. It really does represent a rather dramatic change in current practice. In my mind, the question of the hour is how and if uh, FAA should shift from the current air traffic control regime uh, to an advanced and more efficient system without undermining safety. And that, I think, has to be the bottom line in any uh, conclusion in this area. The implications of free flight are undeniably attractive. But implementing these changes requires extraordinary changes in the management of air traffic and an exhaustive validation of the technologies upon which free flight relies. The FAA is presently involved in a kind of a critical review of, of where they're going with the, uh, the upgrade of the over our system. I think this hearing is an appropriate time to be held this hearing because of that review is ongoing. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for calling this morning's session. Appreciate your permitting me to be a part of the hearing and thank our witnesses for taking time to be with us today. Well, thank you, Mr. Klinger. We uh, appreciate you being with us and uh, <coughs> look forward to working with you on this. Uh, next, I'll recognize uh, our newest member, uh, Mr. Lucas from uh, Oklahoma. Glad to have you with us. Uh, Mr. Shays, do you have a... Uh, we're, uh, our first panel of witnesses today uh, are uh, Michael Boyd, the president of the uh, Aviation Systems Research Corporation. Uh, if you want to come up... Um, I uh, was accompanied by Captain Michael Biotti, Biotta, and uh, president of RMB Associates, and also Norman Watts of the FAA. Um, we uh, also have Captain William Cotton, the manager of air traffic and flight systems with United Airlines, and uh, Roger Fleming, senior vice president of operations and services of the Air Transport Association of America. Uh, it is the custom in the uh, Gover Government Operations Committee uh, investigative hearings to swear in all witnesses. Uh, do any of you object to uh, being sworn in? If not, would you please uh, stand and raise your right hand? Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so what you got? I do. Thank you. You can be seated. Uh, 
all of your statements, uh, written statements, will be entered in the record, so uh, you can uh, uh, summarize or however you want to do it. Uh, we appreciate uh, you being with us, and uh, apparently, so, um, so Mr. Boyd, I guess we'll start with you and uh, thank you to the committee. Appreciate Mr. Chairman, here. thank you. We want to thank you for having us here to discuss this issue. Uh, today, I think, to sort of set the, 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 the pace here a little bit, what we would like to see happen is three basic things. One, a realization that the current system, while safe, does cost not only the airline industry but the economy of the United States billions of dollars a year, and it needs to be addressed with whatever technology is there today or can be found. The second is that the technology and the time frame involved are not as great, we believe, or the money is as great as otherwise believed in terms of getting a free flight system in place. But the third point, I think, it, which is critical here, is to understand the gravity of this situation. We've seen the airline business lose billions of dollars over the last few years. We have seen uh, various estimates from $3.5 billion to $5 billion in annual cost to the airline industry every year due to the current air traffic control approach. The problem there is that that is a major controllable cost. And what the major airlines have talked about in the last two years is basically one controllable cost, that's labor. And what we've had is labor unions and other employees giving up hard-earned hard -earned wages and work rules in exchange for keeping their companies alive. If we had a free flight system, they would not have had to do that. The basic savings estimated by the ATA, which we think are very conservative, would equate to essentially the same amount of money that United employees just gave back to their company to keep it, quote unquote, alive. So there's a major issue there in terms of keeping airlines alive. But it goes well beyond that. What uh, concerns me and concerns other of us here is that we need to elevate air traffic control from the, the area of technocrats and lower level people at airlines and put it right smack in the top of the inbox of major airline CEOs. I have not seen the CEO of American Airlines or of Delta or of United mention this issue. They should be here. They should have a conga line going into the FAA administrator's office right now demanding change because it's costing them money and it's a controllable cost. Before they go to labor, they need to talk about this issue because it is controllable. Another point is the other costs to the industry are enormous. U.S. Air canceled an order for 40 Boeing jets. We had a free flight system. I would maintain they probably could have ordered those jets. So the current air traffic control system is constricting the entire economy, the economy of Hartford, Connecticut, the economy of Idledale, Ohio, the economy of, of uh, St. Louis, the economy of places even like Cedar Rapids where they make avionics. So the system is hurting the entire economy, not just the area of, of airlines or the consumer who flies airlines. That's why it's critically important that we address this. And most importantly, it's critically important that others in the industry get involved, that the chairman and CEOs of major airlines be here and not pass it down the line, that they understand that this is a cost, that heads of labor unions understand that the air traffic control system is costing their members and what they have bargained for over the years money. Uh, the chairman and, and CEOs of companies like General Electric Aircraft Engines, uh, Northrop, uh, Textron should be here and, and look into this because it's directly affecting them and their jobs and their futures. It goes well beyond this. And we believe a free flight system could make this happen. And in a moment, I, I'm sure Captain Beata will tell you about how it can happen, but we believe this is probably the most pressing need right now facing the airline industry. It is not labor costs. It is not the other endemic inefficiencies that some major airlines seem to be in love with. The problem here today that's most controllable is the issue of air traffic control. When we solve that, the airline industry can return to health, the consumer can benefit, and so can, so can communities. And I'll pass it over to Captain Piano. Thank you. Before defining or outlining what free flight is, a few important baselines and assumptions must be outlined. Number one. There's not an airspace capacity constraint anywhere in the world today. We only have ATC capacity constraints. If time permitted, we could go up on the roof. And we could count the number of airplanes you see at one time in the space. You're looking at hundreds of cubic miles of airspace, and if you see more than one to two airplanes, I'd be surprised. The view of the, the uh, constraints in the sky today 
come from the view of the controller, an 18-inch video screen. By the time you put the data blocks and other depictions of the aircraft, it looks crowded, but if you actually put the aircraft's size in relation to the airspace presented, it would probably be less than one pixel and not even be visible on the screen. Two, free flight is not chaos or random actions by individual aircraft. It will not reduce safety. In fact, as lateral and vertical navigation increase through GPS and other technologies, it will actually increase safety by providing random routes back into the system. Three, regardless of the testimony you may hear today, technology is available today to allow the free flight concept to move forward quickly. Not 2000 or beyond, today, now. Four, the current ATC control-oriented philosophy must be replaced with an ATM separation management philosophy. This is the hardest problem faced, the philosophical change required to, re to move forward into the free flight environment. With these baselines and our assumptions, we can now really define free flight, which is really a simple concept. I've heard it from some of the congressmen this morning. Free flight is user-optimized, dynamic routes. Fixed routes and altitudes, the linearization of traffic flows to use today to assure separation would be replaced with technology identifying potential conflicts long before they happen. This will allow each, air, each aircraft's flight path to be optimized by the owner or operator individually as part of that operator's system and in relation to the airspace system. In other words, let the people who own the aircraft asset control it. The simple business requirement, which for the airlines is control of its production line, is in fact enjoyed by all, all other non-regulated industries today. As part of our written testimony, we have submitted a proposal that with relatively inexpensive, off-the-shelf hardware and software, free flight can be implemented quickly and at so estimated one-hundredth the cost of the two and a half billion dollars already spent on the advanced automation system. This proposal is not meant to be the definitive answer for free flight, but it will begin the philosophical change so desperately required so the airlines can regain and capture their, the control of their production lines. Remember, ATC's primary task is to separate aircraft. Don't let them hit each other. The current control methodology used to do this is rooted in the 1950s technology and is no longer required. Finally, the question is not if free flight will be implemented, but it's how many more airlines and companies will go out of business before, in fact, free flight is implemented. Thank you. Watch. I didn't have a prepared talk, but I, I think I would just like to say that free flight is not a technology. Free flight is a better way to use our nation's airspace to support user-preferred flight profiles. We need to reorient our thinking on control of airspace to those who manage airspace. The controllers in the current system envision a lot of problems happening up there, and they only happen in their minds. And I think that for a very, very small amount of money and for a far less complication, free flight is a simpler, because it's solving the right problem, it's a simpler solution, it's a better solution, and it's one that would certainly work tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we'll move to uh, Captain William Cotton um, with United Airlines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am Bill Cotton. I'm the manager of air traffic and flight systems for United Airlines, uh, one of the nation's leading carriers and the one that uh, provided the finale at the Oshkosh Air Show just over a week ago. I uh, hope that maybe you were able to see that, Mr. Chairman. No, I had to leave before, the, it was before that happened. Show. So <laughs> I heard it was. Several years ago, the member nations of the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, agreed to establish new systems to support air navigation worldwide. Known as the FANS for Future Air Navigation System, this new concept for navigation, communications, and air traffic management makes use of satellite technologies for functions that are now performed by terrestrial systems. These new systems provide for more accurate navigation and rapid, high-integrity data communications which together can be used as the basis for a far more efficient system of air traffic management. 
The driving force behind the fans concept is economic. Both users of the airspace and providers of air traffic services can realize dramatic savings from the proper implementation of fans. For the users, these savings come from removing most of the current restrictions to flight, which now prevent us from flying the most efficient path between airports. The term user preferred trajectories is used by ICAO to describe this capability. We at United coined the term free flight to mean this ability to routinely fly user preferred trajectories without unnecessary restrictions. Free flight is simpler to say and to remember than user preferred trajectories. The losses to airspace users created by an unnecessarily restrictive ATC system are staggering. At United alone, inadequate air traffic system capacity and flexibility cost us well over $600 million last year. And the potential productivity of those wasted hours of airplane and crew time amount to more than twice that amount. This staggering loss was more than enough motivation for us to get involved in trying to shape the evolution of ATC and using the fans' concepts into a system that would first provide the necessary flight safety, but simultaneously accommodate free flight by making much more flexible and therefore efficient use of the airspace. Air traffic control performs two basic functions. The first is separation of aircraft, simply keeping airplanes within their jurisdiction from running together. The second function is traffic flow management, the process of getting aircraft in line for the runways spaced at a rate the airport can accommodate. The problem lately has been that the second function overrides the first so that aircraft bound from, for New York are literally getting in line while still over the Pacific Northwest. This is because our present air traffic system lacks both the capacity and the flexibility for efficient operations. The free flight concept would have ATC separate aircraft on a tactical basis as conflicts arise among aircraft flying their most efficient flight paths. Traffic flow management should be accomplished by ensuring that the numbers of aircraft entering a terminal area will not exceed what it can handle, but on the basis of timing, not forcing airplanes of different speeds to fly single file all the way across the country. Administrator Hinson has recognized the ATA-sponsored industry GNSS CNS team as the proper forum for FAA to work with the airspace users to define the operational requirements for U.S. air traffic management under the FANS concept. Uh, the support of this committee would be most valuable <coughs> in ensuring that FAA does, in fact, respond to, you, uh, to user input as they try to recover from the cancellation of the advanced automation system. Uh, we, the users, cannot afford a repeat of the advanced automation system mistake any more than the people of the United States can afford to pay for it. There must be near-term automation improvements that provide user operating benefits. It will not take, nor can we wait for, a complete replacement of the FAA's automation infrastructure for this to occur. We need free flight as soon as possible. The viability of the air transport industry is at stake. In the written testimony, Mr. Chairman, there is a copy of Air Traffic Management in the Future Air Navigation System, which describes the free flight concept in more detail by each phase of flight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Captain Cotton. Um, next, we'll have uh, Roger Fleming, Senior Vice President of Operations and Services of the uh, Air Transport Association of America. Thank you, Welcome Mr. Chairman, and good morning. As I'm sure you know, U.S. air carriers have lost more than $12.8 billion during the past four years. Airlines have been forced to take aggressive steps to stem these losses. They've reduced capacity, they've reduced capital expenditures, and regrettably over 100,000 people have lost their jobs. That brings me to the central focus of this testimony. A major contribution to airline operating costs that cannot be controlled by the airlines at the present time is inefficiency in the ATC system. As you yourself and several of your colleagues have pointed out, we at ATA have estimated that those inefficiencies in the air traffic control system approximate $3.5 billion a year. 
and as has already been stated, we believe that is a conservative estimate. We also realize it's not possible to hope to save all of that excess operating cost, uh, but we think it's reasonable to set as a goal saving half of it. As to the matter of airline CEOs being concerned about this level of cost, I can assure you that they are. And in fact, Captain Cotton has been assigned by airline chief operating officers of ATA to head this effort. And I'm the ATA officer responsible for working with him on these matters. The present ATC system has not kept pace with growth in the air transportation industry. Most of the existing equipment procedures for the separation of aircraft for traffic flow management are based on obsolete manual systems and human intervention. There is no shortage of navigable airspace, even in the busiest terminal areas. The present system, with its inflexibility and excessive separation standards, has simply run out of capacity. Furthermore, the current methods of manual traffic control routinely waste landing and takeoff opportunities at the busiest airports. The foundation for a viable and efficient ATC system is reliable and efficient equipment for communications, navigation, and surveillance, as well as automation and the other tools the air traffic controllers need to manage the nation's air transportation system. These are the improvements needed in the FAA infrastructure to provide the airlines and other users the free flight concept that was described already by several witnesses. The most important and vital program for improving the ATC system is the Advanced Automation System, which provides the hardware for capacity improving programs known as Automated En Route ATC and Center Tracon Automation System. The recent FAA announcements concerning the AAS or Advanced Automation System have placed the entire program in jeopardy and demonstrate the past in inability of FAA and the contractor to manage the AAS requirements process. FAA has now made decisions regarding redirection of the AAS program, which are contrary to the recommendations that the airlines made after having reviewed the status of the program with FAA and with IBM and the successor, Laurel. The recent FAA decisions to restructure the program have caused the airlines serious concern that the effort put forth so far by FAA and the AT AAS contractor will have provided the ATC system users virtually nothing after more than 10 years and $2.5 billion of expenditure. We believe that the phases of the AAS program, which can still be implemented, are the initial sector suite system and the terminal and advanced automation system. These phases of the AAS are important to replacing old technology and providing the base system for future expansion. The transition to future air traffic management system has already started. Unfortunately, the transition to date is focused on technology with only a hazy concept for the future air traffic management concept. This is a backward and high-risk approach since benefits flow from air traffic management, not directly from technology. Further, major decisions on systems architecture, performance, and capacity are dependent on the end state concept. And that end state concept is described in some de detail in the attachment to Captain Cotton's paper that he just referred to. FAA is not moving fast enough, and it has not focused adequate attention on air traffic management issues. The concept of user preferred routes or free flight must be pursued cooperatively by FAA and the airlines and other users. Without real world benefits, the airlines will be skeptical of user charges paid by passengers and shippers for systems that are planned but never delivered or systems that do not satisfy the needs of the users. In summary, Mr. Chairman, a future air traffic management concept that maximizes the payoff from available technology has not yet been developed. The primary objective of this new free flight concept must be designed for the greatest flexibility, leading to increased capacity and efficiency. 
It must significantly reduce delays, decrease operating costs, and provide improved safety and service for the passengers and shippers using the national air transportation system. Rapid development of a strong government and industry consensus on an air traffic management plan is needed, and benefit-based transition planning must start immediately. I note in taking a cursory look at the testimony planned by Mr. Steve Brown of AOPA for your third panel discussion this morning that he includes recommendations on pursuing um, airport capacity studies and implementations, implementation of the recommendations from those studies. Airlines certainly strongly support that kind of action, and I'm sure Mr. Brown will address it in his comments. Finally, Mr. Chairman, we need your help as well as the assistance of your committee colleagues to affect changes in procurement law and FAA acquisition practices needed to reduce the time required to implement new ATC systems. We cannot satisfy the public need for safe and efficient air transportation without major improvements in the procurement process. That completes my statement this morning, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure all of us are prepared to answer any questions you may have. I want to thank all of you for your uh, <coughs> testimony. And uh, Mr. Cotton, uh, um, I don't think I have this paper that you're talking about, or do I? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the copies which were provided at the press table have that uh, attached to it. Uh, I have one here, and I'll be happy to I'm get it. I'm not sure if I have it. Um, we will make sure that you do, Mr. Chairman. Okay. There are about 100 of them here. Yeah, all right. Um, how much, uh, Mr. Boyd, uh, how, do, you, do you know how much uh, airport capacity could be uh, added if we do this right? Well, the way we think a significant amount. Do you have a number on it? Uh, specific? <laughs> Depends on the airport and where you are. Please do. Uh, allow me, sir. Uh, the current airport capacity is limited pretty much on the runway acceptance rate and the final approach segments. Uh, we're talking in the Chicago airport, probably in the neighborhood of 110 on a good VFR day with the weather nice like it is today outside to 120 aircraft per hour. Uh, if, in fact, with a flow management system as Captain Cotton has addressed uh, and we get the acceptance rate of the runways in all types of weather with some of the newer technologies as GPS and other philosophies can in fact bring down, uh, we could probably approximate landing an aircraft on the runway, probably at minute thresholds, uh, raising the acceptance rate to somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 to 60 aircraft per hour, uh, which would in fact, uh, in a three runway operation, somewhere approach 180 aircraft per hour. Well above probably the demand of the aircraft, demand of the airport, which is probably driven by the gates available. Uh, in a, you know, a bad day, 200 foot ceiling, uh, they, how many do they land at O'Hare? Uh, I, Captain Cotton probably has a better idea of that, but I'm, I'm guessing it's probably they go to two runways. It's about 60. 60 an hour. So it'd be about triple if it, if it all worked right. So, I mean, it's a significant increase. Uh, how, what role would GPS play in all of this? I, or I guess we're going to have this, uh, this uh, whatever this thing is called here, uh, um, displayed. When I was looking at it in Oshkosh, and uh, looked to me like we could hook this together with the GPS, and you know, how, how would the GPS um, integrate into all of this? GPS is part of the solution. But as Mr. Fleming said, the benefits from all the technology flow from the application of air traffic management. Current in a control-oriented philosophy, the limitations are not navigation capability. Yeah. Most of the airlines today have flight management system with accuracies a tenth of a mile or 600 feet. GPS increases that to 300 feet. Uh, that's not the issue in there. Will it, in fact, benefit the airlines and the whole aviation community as it's doing today in GA? Absolutely no question. But you have to get through the, the ATM issues first. Yeah. Well, if we got the philosophy changed, it seemed to me like you could um, give every airplane in America a GPS code, and you could beam this up to the satellite and beam it back into the uh, airplane, and you'd know where every plane was and where what l altitude it was at and which direction it was flying, and you could display it right in your airplane. I mean, is that where we're heading? 
Is that where we should be heading? Yes, Mr. Chairman, you've just described a concept that is known as automatic dependent surveillance, or ADS, broadcast, in which the position of each aircraft is determined on board using GPS as the best source, and then broadcast at an interval such as once per second to every aircraft in the vicinity and also to the control system on the ground. Uh, in, in concept and in fact, uh, in the future, this could replace radar as a surveillance system for air traffic control. Right. And, and is anybody suggesting that or is that being studied? It has been suggested. I'm sure that the FAA is also aware of it. It has not yet been studied to the, to the degree that it must in order to become an implemented system. But, but clearly it can be done. Yes, sir. I mean, I don't think there's any question about that, right? That's right. Uh, um, explain to me, uh, y you were saying you, you, you apparently want part of the auto advanced automated system to be kept, Mr. Fleming? That's what you said. Mr. Chairman, we recommended that of the total program that we believe that the initial sector suite system can be completed successfully. What does well that explain what that is? Those, uh, the IEEE's portion of that program is intended to produce the new workstations that would be made available for controllers at the en route air traffic control centers as well as the major terminal control facilities. Okay, so these are new screens and, and new computer boards, I imagine. And local area network. Right. And eventually software. Okay. Is this stuff going to be compatible with moving to this other technology, or if we get into this, are we going to get locked into something that isn't going to work with, uh, and you know, and therefore get constricted into some uh, uh, obsolete system, or can this be incorporated into some of these other ideas we're talking the, about? The the automation capabilities that would be introduced by the key segments of the triple A S triple A A S. Sorry. Uh, would provide the base upon which these new capabilities could be introduced. Changes would clearly be required. Right, but it, but it isn't going to lock us into something that will preclude us from getting farther. Absolutely not intended to do so. I, I would like to make an addition to this, uh, Mr. Fleming's comment, and that is that we have a means of doing something in the background. And in, in my operational free flight system implementation plan, I don't think you should stop doing anything. Whatever we're doing now, we should continue. But we have to be aware that if you did something like an adjunct, you just let it free think its way in, let free flight mature itself in the, in the concept of what the users want and what the FAA and, and other people think they can really have, maybe 98 percent, 99 percent, but it's certainly going to be a lot more than what they're going to get in an AAS system. Do that in the background, and then at some point in time, you folks are going to, or Congress are going to look at this thing and say, my goodness, it is simpler, it is more user-friendly, it is doable, let's go with it. I, but, not, but I think it would be foolish to say, stop AAS. Right. But it's, it's not uh, foolish to say, let's look at something in the background. Right. And that, all I was getting at is, it seems like so often with these computer systems, we get into, locked into some mainframe or some kind of technology that precludes us from getting to where we need to get, and that's what I was concerned about, that we don't get into that kind of a situation. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, that is intended to be an open systems design capable of the kind of expansion Mr. Watts is talking about. Uh, we're, that's about five minutes. I don't, we, we couldn't find a light, Mr. Zeloff. Uh, evidently, the government forum has not gotten to the Employment, Housing, and Aviation Subcommittee, but... Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'll, uh, <laughs> um, on the AAS system, uh, with the amount of money that we've already put forward, um, and with all the changes in the recent sale and, and the mismanagement of, of the project, or at least it appears to be, um, what is it that we need to do to get that back on track and, and, uh, and, and can it get put uh, back on track? Mr. Fleming. In response to your question, the FAA has to come forward with a plan for recovery, which they have not yet done. We, as you can see from our statement and our commentary in response to the chairman's questions, 
favor retaining at least the key elements of AAS and building upon them. Uh, we did not agree that the whole AAS system as originally uh, conceived should survive. That clearly is not in the cards and it's not justified. Uh, the administrator and his key managers, uh, and you will have several of them before you shortly, are busily engaged, I am quite confident, in developing such a plan, but it hasn't been made known to the users. And I thought Mr. Klinger uh, made a very astute observation in his opening comments about uh, having the opportunity at the present time to rethink the approach to air traffic control and in the concept of an open system design, having the capability to add on new functionality as Mr. Watts just suggested. I think those are some of the key points. Uh, the airlines realize full well that without the automation base in the air traffic control system, we will never realize most of the benefits of GPS as operators that have to comply with the instrument flight rules. General aviation will be able to realize many of the benefits. Airlines will not, absent that automation base. And you indicated in your testimony that, that over the past four years we lost $12.8 I guess, in, in cumulative losses for the industry. Uh, and with the free flight system, uh, potentially uh, tremendous savings. Uh, I believe, Michael Boyd, you indicated that uh, we would have, we would see robust profits uh, if, if we could change the system. Uh, are you telling me that, that if we could move to free flight and we could move to uh, better automation, getting computer systems up, that we then will have a profitable industry? I would not make such a claim. Uh, Mr. Boyd has addressed the cost side of the equation. He did not address the revenue side of the equation. If, in fact, airlines elect to compete away the savings in the marketplace, they can still lose money. So can any other business, I would add. I, I think you're probably <laughs> going to be absolutely correct. If I might add to that, um, the revenue side is, is there and the management side is there, and, and this would not solve all the airline industry's problems because there's some endemic, as I stated, to the the way they do business that they have to change in addition to this. But it certainly would put them in a better position to compete. Lower costs always do. So um, the revenue side, we don't know, depending upon certain issues. But Mr. Fleming does have a point. Uh, my issue is that uh, if we had this there, we would have a more efficient airline industry. That's all there is to it. I, I completely agree with Mr. Boyd's point. Uh, discussion, the administration has talked about privatizing the FAA. Uh, when you look back at computer system and other things, uh, do you think that there has been mismanagement and what are your comments on privatization of FAA and how would you see that affect the things we're talking about today? In response to your question, I closed with a plea for the, the assistance of the Committee on Procurement Reform and that's one of the key elements that we all wistfully hope privatization or FAA reform or for that matter government-wide reform might introduce. Uh, as you know, the Secretary has not come forward with a specific legislative proposal yet. Uh, I expect that he will do that in due course. And it's very difficult for, to critique um, or even make intelligent comments about a proposal that hasn't been put to the Congress in this case. If, if I may, sir, I, I thought I'd add there that uh, there, there's no need to be doctrinaire about privatization versus staying the way it is. And I think it's kind of a non sequitur in terms of getting what we're talking about here today done. I don't see where privatization would, would uh, accelerate that process in any way, shape, or form. And certainly the, the documents I've seen seem a little bit rosy rather than, uh, shall I say, realistic about it. So I don't really think, I, I think it's at this point sort of a non sequitur in terms of trying to get where we need to go. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Klinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the panel for your uh, uh, very interesting and helpful testimony. Uh, just a couple of points. Does everybody, uh, Mr. Fleming uh, indicated that, uh, you know, whereas there have been a lot of problems with AAS, and heaven knows uh, ever since NAS plan and all through this whole sorry saga of uh, being assured that things were on track and under budget and, uh, you know, meeting the timeline and everything, and then being told time after time that, whoops, we miscalculated, it's going to cost more money and it's going to be late. 
that whole saga, I guess the question really is, uh, Mr. Fleming thinks that we can preserve and, and uh, you know, save part of this investment, and it is an enormous investment that we have thus far in the AAS uh, system. Uh, do you all share that belief that you, in other words, if we were to go to a free flight uh, concept, are parts of the AAS program compatible with that, and, uh, uh, or do we have to scrap the whole thing? Some of you seem to be suggesting that uh, the whole thing had been a waste and we should just uh, forget it and start all over again. And isn't that going to be a, a horrendously expensive proposition? Uh, I, I don't uh, agree completely with AAS. Uh, I never have because I think it, as you said, Mr. Fleming said, it's 10 years and billions of dollars. But at this stage of the game, it really is the only game in town, and the conservative approach is, in fact, to continue with that. But beyond that, AAS will not give us free flight. The change in philosophy will give us free flight. Technology will not give us free flight. It's the change in philosophy that will give us free flight. So AAS does not guarantee free flight. And I take somewhat of a simplest approach that, in fact, if the problem is, in fact, keeping airframes from running into each other, Maybe the AAS and the whole command and control functions that AAS brings back, brings it, continues to keep in the system may not be there. So I fully support the AAS and what needs to be done to continue that, but we need to look at other solutions to the problem that put it in a much simpler light, i.e. solve the right problem. And to be honest, I'm not sure AAS does, but be, given the only game in town, we have to move forward with it. Uh, but let's look at other things. The proposal that we uh, came forward with we're talking probably to prove the viability of that program under a million dollars. Uh, and in fact, if it worked, would provide you free flight much simpler, much quicker than AAS could ever do, and would have a major impact on what the final AAS is in the world, in the air traffic world. Let me ask you this. Uh, as I understand the concept, the, the decision of how to get from point A to point B uh, rests with the pilot uh, in this instance, uh, and her free flight concept. And that at some point, I would presume, as you near the airport, you must come, un come under active control. Is that correct? Yes. Could I comment on that, sir? The decision rests with the pilot, uh, or in the case of an airline, the pilot and his company uh, at all times. But in fact, throughout the flight, it is proposed, even in the free flight concept, that the control system is capable of intervening when and as necessary to resolve conflicts among airplanes and to do the traffic flow management function throughout the flight. It's just that the freedom of action is an order of magnitude greater under the free flight concept. Okay, two, two questions I have then. Uh, we're anticipating a, not, not an exponential growth in, in, uh, in air travel, but certainly a steady growth in all the, you know, Boeing and everybody projects a rather substantial increase in aircraft as well as uh, travel. Uh, are there safety implications involved the, with this concept if you keep, I mean, you, I think you were alluded to the fact that you could go up on the roof and find very few planes out there. That may not be the case uh, 10 years from now. We may have, uh, in other words, airspace is going to get a little more crowded. Does this become a, uh, a little more difficult concept when you have a vast increase in air traffic? I, I think, and you're right, will traffic increase under free flight? Absolutely. Uh, and I think it's the only way we'll get the rosy projections to in fact come true. Uh, at some point, there will be limited resources. Currently, the resources are constrained today by the air traffic control, controller and environment, not the physics of the, the uh, equation. At some point, in fact, you will come into contact or come up against a physical restraint or constra constraint that you can apply. And that, as Captain Cotton has said, or flow management, and we view flow management as being done in the airlines or the operators to maximize or choreograph the entrance or arrivals into the restricted or limited uh, resource, i.e. the runway resource is probably the most uh, limiting in the fact in the near term. So the flow management will in fact control that and manage it safely, once again relegating air traffic management, and I use the word management rather than control purposely, to the function of separating aircraft uh, in the whole airspace environment. Let me, uh, let me ask you this. The, you've indicated, uh, well, um, being an air traffic controller is a high stress operation. Uh, burnout is a common problem there. And, and uh, it seems to me that this might exacerbate that because you were, 
basically taking the control away from the controller. He is going to be uh, a reactor rather than having uh, control of the situation at any given time. He's going to be asked to monitor uh, a segment uh, where he does not really dictate how that segment is going to be managed. It's going to be in the, in the pilot's control or the company's control. Doesn't this uh, uh, raise the threshold of, of uh, angst on part of uh, an air traffic controller? No, sir, I don't believe that it does. The, the concept would have the automation actually be involved in the process of separating airplanes. <coughs> right now, when we talk about advanced automation systems, we're talking about a new computer for the controller's display and for processing of data for them. But the computers to this point have never been involved in the actual separating of airplanes themselves. And that's where the angst uh, that you mentioned comes for controllers. Under the free flight concept, he is removed to a very significant degree from that process by the automation. He becomes more of a system manager and therefore his level of stress should be greatly reduced. Just one final question. Um, you alluded to the fact that we should, uh, they should be beating down the doors here at the FAA by the CEOs of the major uh, companies. Why aren't they doing that? Mr. Fleming, do you have a comment? Mr. Boyd? <laughs> Well, Mr. Klinger, I intentionally mentioned that Captain Cotton and I are the designated hitters of the CEOs to accomplish that objective. Uh, the action happens to be with the chief operating officers for the most part on this particular subject rather than the chief executive officers. But in fact, um, the industry GNSS CNS team effort that is referred to in Captain Cotton's testimony is chaired by Captain Cotton and I am the principal ATA staff officer that pursues these matters and we are working with our colleagues at the FAA uh, in the early stages of pursuing this free flight concept. Our focus in recent months has been primarily on uh, GPS and GNSS but that program we all believe is well on track and the objective now is to realize the benefits from air traffic management which is where the potential cost savings are for the airlines. I think my point made was, uh, despite the distinguished credentials of the folks up here at this table, was that I think this needs to be elevated where CEOs are directly involved, as they are in labor negotiations, as they are in terms of other negotiations to buy airplanes or sell airplanes or lease airplanes. It's that critical so that I think the presence and the direct involvement of CEOs would elevate this to a higher level where I think we might be able to get more done, um, where the importance of it would be a little more obvious. And I believe it needs to be elevated to the level where the CEOs of these airlines are taking an active and aggressive stance on this, as well as going through industry organizations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I suppose more in way of a comment than really a question. As the chairman alluded to earlier, having only been a member of this fine body for slightly over a couple of months now, I find the one comment about competing away the cost savings most fascinating. Coming from a background in agriculture where we work diligently to adopt the newest technology so that we can then compete for the resources and run the rate of return down to its lowest conceivable level, I can uh, identify with that statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shays. My sense is that the, the issues involved here are safety, time, and cost. In other words, I f er, care first about, about safety, then I care about time, and then I care about cost. W we're looking at a, at a plan that was supposed to be in 1992 that's going to be maybe 1998. Uh, we're looking at a, a, a program that was basically $2 billion, now up to $7 billion. Is, is this accurate in, in so many words? I, I, I would like to say that I think if we stay with, with ATC or control, we're, we're definitely going to have a problem. And the problem is not going to go away because we're solving the wrong problem. Okay. You, if you want to manage the airspace, you don't control it. Now, it's antithetical. So to me, as long as we keep our control hats on, or the FAA or, or this, this body or anybody else, we're going to continue to pour good money on top of good money. And, and, and so eventually it's going to overwhelm us. And that's why I would, I would think we have to look at and set up a group of people, one f within the FAA, to, to work with the industry, to work with the airlines, work with ATA, work with the pilots, the people who want to use the airspace, and make sure that their wishes and desires are the m maximally attained without compromising safety. And I think we can do that. I think that 
But I don't, I don't think we should stop doing what we're doing. We have to do it a little bit differently. We have to say, let these people free think it's in the free flight, and this, let's see where we get. And I think we'll get there. Mm -hmm. I, I, but I think if we say we're going we're gonna to make it an adjunct or a, a, a part of, of AAS, it would, be, it would be wrong. It's not going to work. You're not going to get there. If, as long as you say that this is going to be a subset of AAS, it, control is not going to get us where we want to go. Because control and, and, and management just two, two opposites of the same extreme. Yeah. Well, what up? Yeah, yes, sir. Could I comment on that, too, sir? The advanced automation system, I think, is what you were referring to as uh, the costs and the timing, cannot be considered as an alternative to what's being proposed here. It's just a computer platform in computer parlance. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily encompass any particular operating philosophy. We're talking about air traffic management, which is the way airplanes are controlled. That is where there has been no focus. We've concentrated on the technologies, on the hardware, without talking about how we are going to manage air traffic. That's what's being proposed here, a new way to manage air traffic using whatever computer platform we can most uh, economically and in, in, in a timely fashion get into place. Uh, the, one of the, the messages that I'm getting, and, and basically it, it, it tells me that the FAA's paradigms totally need to change, that they need to, we're getting a lot of echo in this, I don't know, but, but, but the paradigm needs to change significantly for the FAA. Um, that's basically the message I'm getting from everyone here, is that correct? That is correct. They have the seeds of this paradigm in something they call the National Route Program, but it's very limited in scope, uh, needs to be greatly expanded and, and improved in the direction of the free flight concept that we have described. And one of the other things that I, I sense here is that since so much money was spent on the AAS -S -S, um, that, that uh, there are some who are going to want to defend it and show that it can ultimately work. Uh, but I also feel that when we, when obviously when, when we're dealing with FAA, safety is just going to be overriding, and, and you're not going to have a sense of taking risk with safety at all. So the safer route, it seems to me, sometimes for a bureaucrat in FAA is to basically take the status quo and move extraordinarily slowly. I mean, is that a mindset that you sense exists? It does indeed exist. Yeah. And it's, it's a tricky one because, of course, safety must be paramount, regardless yeah. of the operating paradigm. Yeah. Uh, but there is nothing in this concept that would ever reduce, in fact, can increase the safety uh, over what we experience today in today's system. Okay. I, I, I would tend to agree that the philosophical change is, and the paradigm shift is one of the major tasks that we face mm -hmm. to go, as Mr. Watt said, from the control orientation to the air, airspace management mm -hmm. orientation. And safety, as both Captain Cotton and I sitting in the front of airplanes, understand safety is the ultimate responsibility of all of the users and mm -hmm. managers of the airspace. But there is methodologies that you can look at, rapid prototype, and look at philosophies or different theories uh, outside of the system that would not have no impact on safety that could be either proven true or not true to, as the operating system to provide this management. And that's, the, that's what we're proposing today. Okay. My, my last question, if I could, is that, that I guess what I'm really wondering, what's the big restraint here, is it, uh, just to have you comment on it, it seems to me that, that um, obviously the free fight would be uh, less costly in the long time. It would save a lot of time. Would it, in fact, be safer? Well, I don't think safety would compromise, uh, fr uh, men would compromise safety at all. Free flight is a way of letting the people use the airspace. To the and you manage it, you can manage it safely. It's okay, to the as safe as a control, looking at a scope saying, okay. go there, do this, or do that. Well, let me just say to the, to, the, to, to the person who doesn't, isn't behind the controls, free flight, you know, you have this vision of people and planes flying any which way. I mean, that, that's the sense of it. The term is a very interesting one. I wonder if we could think of another no, I, term. I think it would be getting the best wind profile, getting the best altitude profile, and if, they, if, they're, fly, if they're going in a, in a cruise climb profile, it's, not playing It concept. sounds like do your own thing. That's the problem. Uh, no, it, but it's not do your own thing. They, they would tell you 20... I, I know that, They'd have to tell you in advance what they want to do if they want you to keep them safe. Yeah. In yeah. other words, they would just roll a plane over. I hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, continuing on uh, with the thoughts of Mr. Shea, obviously safety is a primary concern of us all, certainly, as you said, sir, those in the front of the, front of the cabin. Uh, Captain Cotton, you, in your 
discussion uh, mentioned that you you foresaw uh, those instances where air traffic control would intervene during conflict. Uh, if this is such a perfect system, what kinds of conflicts are we talking about? They do intervene <coughs> during conflict today. Even though we fly with a flight plan, with a clearance, that clearance is not deconflicted. Conflicts are resolved as they occur, even on a fixed route structure. That's today. That's today. What about f during free flight? We would not have a fixed route structure, and they would still resolve conflicts as they occur. Well, there would actually be fewer of them because we would be more spread out uh, through the airspace than we are today with the same number of airplanes. In, in fact, uh, one of the analysis that Mr. <coughs> Watts did uh, under a free flight environment ran a computer simulation to determine the conflict rate. And that's a very critical issue. If, in fact, you go to a free flight environment where there's not random actions, there's random routings, and there's a big difference between the two, as we discussed earlier, uh, that, in fact, the conflict rate is the, on the order of somewhere between uh, four, four to five conflicts per hour per controller. That's an order of magnitude, and that's not a, a definitive analysis. But it gives you probably the conflict rate, and I don't know the answer to this, is probably uh, not that much less than that in the current environment, just given the, the current structuralized, linearized air traffic control system today. So we're not talking about a quantum leap in controller action. What we're talking about is using technology and the management of the forecasting, what we call a conflict probe, the ability of the technology to look forward on the path in the near term, not the long term, a tactical separation that would allow the two aircraft, the controller, to visualize, not with his eyes, but with the controller, uh, with the uh, technology, if a conflict would in fact occur and resolve it. So the workload or the uh, conflict rate by the controller would not go up significantly under the free flight environment but it based on up. initial studies. But it would go up in your opinion? I, I think it's, as I said, it's on the same order of magnitude and that's all we can say today until we do a more definitive study to take a real-time plug in Mr. Watts's computer to a real-time uh, uh, data coming data flow coming from uh, FAA and determine those kind of questions. So it might not go up. I, I think it would be a misnomer to conclude that the automation program that that it, when someone says I want a free flight and he wants to change something with it, he gives you a little bit of advance. No, it's your problem, and then you find out what you can give him, and you may talk to the dispatcher or you may talk to the pilot, whichever one is is in the loop. And, and resolve and give him what he wants. But you never just say, just do something, and then two seconds later say you're going to crash. I mean, you would always be probing and looking far enough in advance, a computer program, that I don't think the controller is going to be the critical. Pro the only thing the controller's role is going to change is going to be a manager. You're going to say, my, my computer says, do this because. And if somebody says, well, what if, what if the computer failed, I think, with the, with the e ever expanding speed and the prop processing power of computer at every decreasing cost, you could have 10 computers for one controller if that's what you felt you had to have. So but you're always probing ahead. You're not, you're not waiting until the, do this right now, that, like we are now. A controller looks at his scope, he says, my God, they're going to come too close together, and he, and, he, and he yells something at one of the pilots, or both pilots. But you would never have that happen. You'd be probing far enough in advance that all you're going to be doing is, is directing, giving you directives of what, what should be done. So you're not increasing control of role, you're changing his role to being a person who communicates what the computer detected based on what these people are now doing in far enough in advance, but not too far in advance, that you know this is exactly what they're going to do. They're just conflict. You don't try to say three hours from now you're going to have a conflict, but you say 20 minutes, 10 minutes. And whether it's 10 minutes or 20 or 25, that's what you have to establish through uh, re analysis of real-time data. You can't just come up with a number right now. But you'd never wait until it's happening before you re re resolve it. You, you wouldn't do it. So I, I, but you wouldn't have the controller being hanging from the yard arm if these two aircraft come together. The computer would have predicted it. Long before, long before the controller would have to react. Well, the, the, I'm, the, I'm just trying to understand what was said yeah. originally by Captain Cotton. Do you or see intervention during conflicts under free flight, in flight during free flight. Yes. Do, we have, yes. do, do we have a communication system now that could uplink, data link the information to the, to the cockpit without having somebody tell the, tell the aircraft what, he, what has to be done? No. So you'd have to have someone directing 
over the voice channel saying do this because change your rate of climb or, 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 or change your heading a little bit. Oh. But so it's not going to increase the number of conflicts. He's not, he's not, he's not resolving a conflict. Right. He's communicating a potential conflict and a resolution. So free flight, you just said, will not decrease the number of conflicts. Well, yeah. I don't know if it increases it either. Yes, Mr. Chairman? Well, I just, uh, you know, I, I think that we're, um, we maybe need to go back to square one and, and get people to understand how the current system works, uh, you know, and, and what this new system will do. The current system puts everybody into one space, <laughs> you know. I mean, it, it basically puts a highway across the sky and puts everybody into this highway, and, it's, and it limits the airspace. And so what we're tra talking about is changing the concept to, uh, to allow people to fly the, the route that would be best for them to fly. And uh, it's, it's, it really, as I said, it's just changing the role of the air traffic controller uh, because we're, doing, we're going about this in a different way. But well, if, well, if you, if, you know, what everybody on this committee should do is go up and fly an instrument flight rule flight and see what happens, you know, under the current system, and then you'd have a lot better understanding of what we're talking about here. I mean, you know, one of the things that's brought up is it's going to overload the pilots if we give them this information all this other stuff. If you've ever flown on these flights, you're so bored that you don't know what to do half the time, uh, you know, and, and most of the activity that takes place is, is one controller trading you off to the next controller. I mean, 90% of your time is, is a complete waste just uh, talking to these controllers to, so they know where you are and you know where they are. Well, that's, that's back in the 50s, uh, why we were doing that stuff. So we can assume you have a position on this, Mr. Oh. Chairman. That's good to know. Uh, I, I'm trying to understand uh, from what I admit is my total lack of knowledge on the system, what I was trying to do was the follow-up on, on what I understood Mr. Shays' question to be and one of the responses and, uh, to understand the differences, if any, between the current system and, and what we're moving into uh, with respect to uh, AAS and free flight. And that is not just the role of the controller, uh, but as Captain Cotton said, the, the level of intervention. Uh, that's all I was trying to do. I, I, I'm not for or against anything here. I'm just trying to understand that. I appreciate your help. Uh, in the background material, Mr. Chairman, that your people, or someone on the committee, I should be careful, uh, gave us, there's a comment about, uh, and I would direct this to the panel, uh, talking about the free flight system. This is one result of free flight, which would give control of the air carrier, quote, production line, end quote, back to the carriers, letting them decide how to reschedule or delay flights due to bad weather at destination airports. Presently, air traffic control changes flight priorities for carriers during bad weather. Uh, would you care to expand on that for me? I, I, we're not talking about who lands or who takes off at an airport experiencing bad weather, are we? We're talking about the rerouting of, of those affected flights, yes? Actually, I think you're talking about both. That's right. In fact, what happens is when bad weather goes through a major hub operation for a major airline today, you have catastrophic delays for a minor change in the weather pattern that, as Captain Cotton said, could line you up all the way back to New from New York all the way to Seattle. Uh, so what happens, ATC will decide the traffic flows, who's in line, uh, many times, I, as a slower aircraft, they'll s speed me up and put a faster aircraft behind me, both the same carrier, and that may not be the operational be operationally beneficial to, the, to that carrier. That, car that airplane behind me may, in fact, have 13 connections to Hong Kong or uh, Seattle or New York, which is more economically feasible for that aircraft to land first. There's no control over that by the operator, so the production line theory basically says the airlines produce a product, the movement of that aircraft seat through the sky, as the controller now controls it basically from cradle to grave. When you back taxi back, and not only do they route you along what they called ATC preferred routes, which are significantly longer, and in one case in our study is 18% longer. I think the United documentation says that 18.8 .8 minutes is uh, wasted in terms of ATC per flight in the domestic system today. So you have that aspect, but then also you have the uh, choreographing of the arrival flows by ATC rather than the operator, which has a significant impact on the operations also. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, there was a reference to the uh, 
national route program as the seeds of a, of a free flight system. Understanding that that covers very few flights, like 700 as I, as I understand it. Uh, how has that seed worked in your opinion? I mean, is it an all-encompassing free flight program on a very small scale or is it just a, a hybrid or uh, it, recognize you want to see this go further and quicker? Uh, is it a good program? Has it worked? It is a good program. It has worked very well for us. And uh, in the first few months, it was saving us on the order of $2 million a month in direct operating expenses. Uh, what it does is it allows us, between certain city pairs, to fly a route that is not the FAA preferred route. It needs to be expanded because it's limited in the altitude in which it can be used. It's limited uh, in the city pairs that you can fly. It's also limited in the amount of that time from takeoff to landing where you are relatively free to plan the route that you would like to fly. Those, uh, it needs to be brought closer to your takeoff point and to your landing point, as well as expanded uh, to more cities and to more altitudes. Thank you. And Mr. Cotton, the reason it's limited is because of the controllers, right? The current, current the, the, system. Uh, you know. The FAA has told us that they're they're taking a very cautious approach to expanding this because what it does is it, uh, by taking the aircraft off of the preferred routes, it allows the conflicts to occur in some other part of a controller's sector than he is normally to. accustomed to seeing them. So again, the, the system is, is restricting it. That's correct. Right. Um, what, um, uh, could you explain, uh, I think you need to explain how how the aircraft would be separated and how this would work under this new system because I, I don't think that everybody's got a clear understanding of that. Could yeah, uh, basically under the current system, and I'd probably start with that quickly first, the controllers linearize the traffic on the highways as you mentioned and then they see conflicts as the highways cross but they know where they are. So they have a better idea of where they are and it's, as I said, probably on the order to three to four conflicts in our controller. I'm guessing at that uh, under the current environment. But the controller has to visualize the conflict as the aircraft are 40 to 50 miles apart, look and see the aircraft that they're, they, that controller thinks they will conflict, and then devise some resolution, somewhere in the order of a 10 to 15 degree turn or an altitude change. And numerous times you'll find that if you get an altitude change with the current TCAS environment, you can see that you never came within 20 miles of that aircraft. In fact, separation today in, in route is five nautical miles with the snitch patch and other uh, work th things the controllers have to work under we're probably looking at an average of eight to ten miles in route and typically as I said sometimes up to fifteen to twenty miles but it's reliant on the controllers visualization of the traffic that's where the stress comes in in my mind but I'm not a controller so I can't really speak for them under the free flight environment what you would do is put the intent of the aircraft into a computer and allow that computer to generate the flight plan forward to determine if, in fact, there's a conflict to be resolved. Once that happens, you can actually have the computer give you the resolution. But that would be the major change and the philosophical change is that the computer now takes over the task of the visualization of the conflicts rather than relying on the controller's mental c capabilities to, in fact, do that. But the controller would still separate if he saw the, uh, he could intervene, call you up and say, uh, make a 15 degree turn just like he does now. The controller, in fact, would have the same, well, maybe not the same radar scope, but some uh, visual display that they could visualize the traffic. So you haven't really changed anything. You've actually added a level of safety because you have a, a first tier uh, conflict probe is the terminology. Now, if you put this uh, into the cockpit as well, some people have said that this is going to overload the pilots. They're going to have this is going to put too much workload on them. Uh, what, do you, what is your response to that? Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, the same thing was said about TCAS before that was added to our aircraft. It's just simply not true. In fact, it's one of the TCAS has provided us a display of traffic around our airplanes. It's uh, probably the single greatest improvement to safety that we've seen in a generation. And it, it would continue to be part of the system. Uh, yes, sir, it would. Well, uh, and I would like to add that if you have data link and you have FMSs in or like a glass cockpit aircraft, then it may do the probing and, and show the pilot what the computer on the ground is seeing. So I don't, the load may go on the, on, on the airborne computer, but again, 
that's not an issue because computer power is not is, is, is going up and up you know, almost every day. Where does this? Where do these comments come from that this is going to overload the pilots and they're going to be uh, too much information? Generally from non-pilots. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think another thing that, that we, we people feel if you put information in the cockpit, you're going to second guess the controller. And, 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 and if you have a control system and you have somebody on the ground that's a job, you're going, to, you're going to hang them from the yard arm if he makes a mistake. Then and that's why we have to change this whole perspective, uh, right. perspective in order to make this work. Uh, because if you limit it, uh, if one person is going to be in control of this thing, it, it just that that becomes the restriction point, right? I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. I think the other thing that everybody needs to that that aren't pilots, uh, you know, VFR aircraft fly around all the time, totally uncontrolled, totally, you know, um, on their w on their own lot more traffic than there is with the commercial system in a lot of places and very few problems uh, and all we're doing is looking at each other to keep ourselves separated and talking to each other on the radio uh, so I think there's a lot of fear on the part of people that don't fly and that don't understand how the system works uh, just in general aviation in aviation altogether that people are uh, afraid of things you get, I, I can visualize the, the, the roadway as you describe in the air, uh, and I can visualize that now we let them go over the fields and whatever else in that sense, but when they get near the airport, do they lock into a, to a, a once they get closer, I would think they would lock in and then have their time. Well, we have a system called CTAS now, and I think it's operational in Denver, and CTAS can set up sequences from 100 miles to 200 miles out. You could have the in-route program making sure the sequence is sure that the right aircraft gets the right time. The sequence could be dictated by, by, by the major airline using that hub so that you make sure that <coughs> it gets the right plane at the right time. And, and, I, and I, I saw it, uh, a simulation results, and they had the same traffic sample and showed controllers controlling the trombone. That's where they fly downwind and then they make a turn onto, onto final. And they had CTAS landing this sequence of aircraft, same traffic sample, and it looked like CTAS had everybody turning just about exactly the same point. A couple moved a little bit early, maybe one was a little bit later. And then they showed the same sequence that was controlled by the controller, and it looked like they had playing staccato. I mean, it was the, the trombone was full. So I, I think what I'm the, the concern about what happened to the terminal area, it may not really be th that true. If CTAS can do as good a job as it can do, then there's no reason to think that, that that it was saying to some in route program, give me these aircraft in the sequence, and then if that sequence, if United Airlines said, I want my 747 right. first, my 757 first. So I get seconds. the gist. I get the gist on it. Uh, Mr. Cotton or Mr. B B B Boyd, could you respond to that question? I mean, once you get in. Yeah, I, I think in the terminal area, we currently rely on a distance based separation on final approach and the linearization of the traffic so the controller can visualize the problem. It's the only way they can do that today. Right. In, a, in the uh, using the C-test that Mr. or any other time management, you move to a time-based separation system where you say, I want an aircraft over the end of the runway every minute. Mm -hmm. And as they approach the airport or the runway, they're actually sequenced based on time, which is in fact a distance. So you have safe separation based on the time sequencing, not the distance-based separation. So you could in fact have aircraft going right to somewhere along a three-mile final, three miles from the end of the runway, and everybody every minute an aircraft goes over that point in space if it's a uh, noise environment or other restrictions you'd have them go over the you know avoid those points thank you mr chairman I just, I just have one quick uh, assuming faa and i assume faa uh, is in support of free flight uh, and and is supporting uh phasing in on a very gradual basis except for the safety concerns is that is that a correct uh, that is correct we are looking for the, the proper uh, venue, the proper organization for the FAA to understand and work with the airspace user community to ensure that our operating needs will be met as they move forward with these plans. And based on what is now happening, when do you think, what would be your guess, best guess of when we will see uh, pre-flight uh, phased in across the board? Or is it not going to happen? It certainly better happen, well, and, and, and yeah. sooner the better. But I and I, I guess don't my think only, it's, it's I guess my, the challenge is, is how do we get 
you all, the rest of the industry and FAA to sit down and put together a plan that phases in over a period of time that satisfies their safety concerns, puts a time certain and say, you know, phase one, assuming no problems, you go to phase two and phase three and eventually you get it done. I mean, it seems like that's, that's our challenge, uh, that we recognize the safety concerns and if they don't materialize, then you move forward to the next step, but you force somehow people, I mean, it, it seems like there's a pretty darn strong consensus, including FAA, that, that it's the right program. With the mandate I, I, from this committee to make sure that that focus is not lost, <laughs> I think we can accomplish that. Well, yeah. we're going to have the Thank FAA you. in the next panel, and I'm not so sure that they are all that enthusiastic uh, from <laughs> some of the experience and conversation I've had, but we'll find out here shortly, I guess. Um, any other members have uh, questions? If not, uh, we thank you all very much uh, for being with us. And, uh, thank you. And you've helped illuminate uh, this subject a lot. We appreciate it. <coughs> uh, next, uh, we have Mr. William Jeffers, the Acting Associate Administrator for Air Traffic with the FAA, who is accompanied by David Hurley, uh, Director of the Office of Air Traffic Ma System Management. Uh, And um, who else is looking there? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. Um, you have a couple other folks with you? Okay, Mr. Chairman, uh, in light of some of the questions that were asked this morning about advanced automation and those types of things, we had some people available, and I did invite them to sit at the table in case those okay. questions come back up. I'll well, we're going to, it's a custom in these Government Operations Committee hearings to swear in all witnesses, so um, do any of you have any objection to that? If not, would you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Uh, I think we have a vote. No. We'll find out yep. in a second. Sorry. Yeah, we just recessed. Yeah. Uh, so, Mr. Jeffers, your written statement will be entered uh, in its entirety in the record. We welcome you to the hearing. Uh, and uh, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I welcome the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss free flight or user preferred routings. Accompanying me is uh, Dave Hurley, Director of the Office of Air Traffic System Management. I've also asked uh, Neil Planzer, Director of the Office of Air Traffic System Requirements, and Mike Ball from our System Development Organization to uh, accompany me this morning. Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter my formal statement, which focuses primarily on the extent to which we employ user-preferred routing, free flight, or what I will now refer to as user-preferred tra uh, trajectories, in today's air traffic management system into the record. I'd like to summarize its contents and then spend a few minutes talking about what we, the FAA, see in the future in the terms of air traffic management. In my prepared remarks, I tell you about a system of placing air traffic on well-defined airways in a nose-to-tail configuration that was devel developed as a result of the air traffic controller strike back in 1981. During that period, we developed a rigid system to ensure a safe environment for the flying public at a time when recovery and restaffing of the system was taking place. Since that time, we have worked consistently to remove static restrictions imposed during that period. As recovery and restaffing occurred, it became possible to experiment with user-preferred tra trajectories. Since 1990, we have moved from the experimental stage of user-preferred trajectories to a well-established program now known as the National Route Program. That allows operators to fly self-directed routes that are more cost-effective, fuel-efficient, or that otherwise meet corporate goals while maintaining the highest levels of safety. Over 700 flights per day are eligible to fly at the National Route Program. Between 50 and 60 percent of those flights elect to do so. Estimated savings under this program are substantial. Although we in the FAA have yet to define what free flight means to us, I think it's absolutely accurate to say that we share, to a very great extent, a vision of a future where user-preferred trajectories are the norm. 
We in particular find ourselves in general agreement with the Air Transport Association with whom we met last Friday to discuss these issues. Most of what, much of what we do in terms of changing the culture of air traffic system management will depend on several ongoing technology development initiatives. I have several examples of our activities to create opportunities for expanded system user interaction, input, and ultimately greater change than we are currently capable of providing. We are proceeding with a request for proposals on a wide area augmentation system that will provide the added assurance of signal availability and reliability to expand use of GPS for more phases of flight operations. Mr. Chairman, because of your interest in GPS, if you are interested in flying a GPS approach, we would be happy to facilitate that for you and, and make it available as uh, any time you would desire. I already did that about a year ago, so we Great. appreciate the offer. Great. Maybe I will do another one. We are also working toward the introduction of more data link services and automatic dependent surveillance while mindful of the pace of user equipage and the development of the aeronautical telecommunications network to provide more information directly to the pilot in the cockpit. Both of these initiatives, or all of these initiatives, will promote the cultural change that is necessary to make user preferred trajectories a reality. We are currently experimenting with the automatic dependent surveillance in areas not serviced by radar to determine the possibilities of reducing current separation standards and improved automation with actual decision support automation such as that provided by the Advanced En Route Automation era will provide users of the national airspace system much greater access to their preferred trajectories. With these technologies, sorry, when these technologies mature, transfer of more and more separation and sequencing responsibilities to the cockpit will gradually become feasible in all but the most densely populated airspace. Mr. Chairman, the long-term goal of user-preferred trajectories whenever possible, and I emphasize this morning that the possibilities are recognized by all as constantly expanding with research and development of new technologies ongoing, is a mutual FAA industry goal. We look forward to working together with the Air Transport Association, other pilot groups, other aviation groups, any users of the national airspace system to develop the full potential of the world's safest air traffic control system. This concludes my remarks, sir. At this point, we would like to give you about a three to five minute demonstration, uh, other members of your subcommittee, uh, of the aircraft situation <laughs> display as kind of a baseline on uh, the aircraft operations over a one-day period in the United States that will give you uh, an idea of, of the transition that we have to make in going from today's system into a, quote, free flight, unquote, system. We would be happy to answer any questions after that presentation. Thank you. We, um, Gentlemen, what you're uh, seeing on the screen there is something we uh, Could we, uh, I don't know if we need both of these. Um, if we put one of these in the middle, I think everybody could see it. Could we turn one of these around so the audience can see uh, what's going on? Maybe set it up in the end of the uh, table there or something? Uh, has it got a long enough cord to do that? or? You set it up on the table. Uh. Can it reach? And you can turn I, it this way. Yeah, I apologize, but uh, I think it would be good for the audience to be able to see. I think we can all see on this one here. Can't we? You can turn it more that way. I can still see. Yeah. You can turn it more that way. You can move over, Mr. Lucas. Yeah, I think we can all see it. We kill them. <laughs> I don't know. Bright lights, kind of. Yeah. Uh, do the television people care if we kill the lights a little bit? 
Um, why don't we? Um, why don't we These turn down the lights? The bright lights. Do we need those television lights on? Can we turn those off? That one up there. Yeah. That helps quite a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. We can get that one then. With Thank okay. You very much. Yeah, that helps. All right. Now we're ready to go. Good morning. My name is Dave Hurley, and I'm the director of air traffic system management for the FAA, the traffic organization. What we're going to show you today is something we call ASD, Aircraft Situation Display. Basically, what that is, it's a culmination of long range radars, 113 of them spread throughout the United States. All the data brought into a central location, mosaic together, then back out into the controller work field as ASD, aircraft situation display. What we're going to do this morning is give you an idea of what is actually out in the environment. We're going to start this machine at 8 a.m. in the morning, and you will see the East Coast essentially with no airplanes. As we progress across the west, to the west coast, you'll see the east coast wake up, the central part of the United States, and then ultimately the western part. States, every one of those white, white dots represents an airplane operating in the IFR system, and you're looking at 8 o'clock p.m. in the evening. And now midnight, 1 a.m., starting to come alive. Six o'clock, you could see a significant increase in the number of flights. Seven, you can truly see. Now you'll see it move westward into the central part of the United States at nine o'clock. And the western part is just starting to, to come alive, if you will, and we move further across. 11 o'clock now. This is now 11 o'clock Eastern. Eastern time moving towards noontime, if you will, in the system. Now, again, those dots represent aircraft that are operating IFR in this system today. And the number of aircraft, can you stop for a period and yeah. tell you how many actual airplanes are out there in this system? 4,236 flights are operating in the system as we speak. And this was on August 4th, this last week. Right. This, this is the stuff that's accumulated in Cambridge? Yes, sir. Yeah. <coughs> and this is what you saw also out at Oshkosh yeah. when you were out there as well. Again, what this is, 113 long-range radars brought to Cambridge, Massachusetts, mosaic together, satellite back out to the Air Traffic Control System Command Center, the centers such as Boston. If the, if the satellite had, uh, if every airplane had a GPS code, uh, could the satellite not... Uh, do this display from looking down and reading these GPS codes and put it on a screen like this? The technology probably could be done that way, yes. But that's not the way the system works now. Well, at the moment, what you're looking at is today's system. The radar system. Right. And it's driven by radar. And to some degree, position reports in the North Atlantic and the Pacific. The system is looking all the way to Europe and all the way to Japan, I might also add. Okay, we're going to give you a show now, if you will, of the Chicago area uh, and the number of aircraft that would appear to be in proximity to each other. Does that represent the biggest uh, area of most traffic? Chicago is a good sampling of the largest area between such Chicago, Atlanta, and the New York metropolitan areas. It'll give you a classic uh, idea of the number of airplanes that we're working. This is Chicago and Midway. This is Chicago and Midway Airport. The blue is Chicago. Yeah. The blue is Chicago and their departure aircraft. The yellow arrivals are arrivals desk to Ford. The rings you see, the outer rings, are hundreds of miles. And in the center of the screen, you see ORD partially obliterated. Now we can zoom down onto Chicago.
much much smaller scale, we can go even further. And again, the blue are departures and the yellow is arrivals. Here we're down to a scale of Plus just under miles. 100 miles. And again, this is a mosaicing of multiple radars around the Chicago area. And this is uh, how much of a delay in real time? Uh, is it how, how, how far behind? In the worst behind? case scenario, with the current technology, five minutes. We are moving towards a one minute display. We have achieved it in a test bed prototype system in the West Coast. We're now looking to how to feed it into the overall system. Okay. So this is fed back to your controllers in the centers and they and the into the traffic management units, not the okay. controllers who separate the airplanes. They provide oversight, if you will. And these uh, and they use this to restrict uh, to decide whether to let planes go or not based on what's out there with this information, right? Basically, this is a tool to look beyond your, your particular airspace or your boundary to see what's coming at you. It is used as a coordination tool and a decision-making tool. And that's... But the actual yeah. separation is the radar controller. Right, but, but they use this information, and that's why they might uh, stop somebody in Seattle from going to New York based on this information. Or, or pieces of this information right. fed together to a communal de determination, right? Okay, you're now looking at the East Coast, which is just about in the center of the New York metropolitan area, with Philadelphia just uh, below the 100-mile range. We can again move into the area. Get a list of what these airplanes are. Um, yeah, I have all the colors been sent to you. With JFK, LaGuardia, and Newark. This is Kennedy, LaGuardia, and Newark traffic. Rouse and departures are all different colors. And the, I, I can go through the colors if you need me, but I, I don't think you get the point. Uh, no, you're, you're, you're going to be down to a minute. Uh, it was my understanding that, uh, that you could probably get this almost up to real time. Is that technology? Technology is there to do that. <laughs> However, it, it, we have not progressed to that point. Um, and this, as I understand it, there's also a display that this theoretically could be fed up to the satellite and into the cockpit of the airplane as a matter on fact, a real-time basis, right? It could be, yes. Right. As a matter of fact, there's a study underway by a private university to do just that kind of thing, a cockpit display that takes this data and synthesizes it for a display within the cockpit itself. What you're looking at is the routes through the system, and the uh, data blocks that identify each and every one of those particular aircraft that are being tracked by the system. Okay. Okay. Uh, DFW. We did the same thing for the DFW area, Dallas Fort Worth. This is just Dallas. 100 mile rings. Arrival and departures, yellow and blue. The odd colors are the small airports surrounding the outer areas of Chicago, uh, of the Detroit complex, the Dallas-Fort Worth complex. And uh, you have the altitude of these airplanes? The yes, that's a bit. We have the altitude, we have the time remaining in flight, and when they will arrive at destination airport. So you can zero in on one of those planes and you can tell what its flight plan is? And we'll do that for you right now. ASC 646 is at 7,000 feet, 1872. Try some others. Okay. Give you departure. Keep going. Okay. Uh, try him. That's another ASC. This is the early part of the rush. We have most of the commuters. You get a jet. Okay. Let me find the jet. Let me just select the flight. The system can also go in and find an airplane if you know what the call sign or the yeah, identification yeah, of the one. aircraft is. It can come in and locate it. These are all flights. Yeah. In the uh, extreme left-hand bottom corner of the uh, screen, you can see American uh, flight 57 or uh, 1573. He's an MD-80. He's at 30. He's climbing to 31,000 feet. 
and his airspeed is 450 knots, and the route of flight is listed across the bottom of the screen, Fort Worth, J66, J4, J50. Now this, uh, now, right now you're just working to uh, speed this up and make this work better. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jeffers, are, are you looking at, is anybody within the FAA looking at making this uh, real time, making this available to pilots in the cockpit, going to that extreme or not? <coughs> Yes, sir. We are exploring the possibility of providing this information to the cockpit. Uh, the relevant information is is very similar to the information that would be provided by TCAS at the present time. Uh, the display of other aircraft in proximity to the uh, to the resident aircraft or the home aircraft uh, is already on the di the TCAS display. But we okay. are looking at that and making this real time. Yes. But the TCAS display is is is. Uh looking out from that aircraft to what's around it. That is correct. So this would be coming from a different source, so it's kind of like a, you know, a, a backup it, information. Right? It would be a backup information, and it would be very relevant as you get in close to congested areas. Um, oh, yeah, and then you also can put the weather, as I understand it, into this. And that seems to me to be one of the things that would really be valuable if that could be displayed in the cockpit. If they could have the current weather information, uh, you know, and show how to get through the thunderstorms and so forth. Can, can you put, is there weather that you can put on here? It's, not, it, it's overlaid. We're going to bring you weather that is taken out of the NWS system versus what you would see in the cockpit. Yeah. At this particular time. Right. But I mean, but you could put the you could uh, eventually you could put that real time weather into this system too, right? I mean the technology is there to do that. Eventually, we should be able to put the uh, all of the Doppler radar information on this. Now, delivery of this to the aircraft is dependent upon our uh, development of the data link uh, network that Through we're working on. Yes, yeah. but that can be done technologically, it, and and it is being done right now, sir. It's uh, it's a matter of getting a two way data link that. Uh, and, and getting the ground equipment and the aircraft equipage that will accommodate it. Uh, and how, how long of a process is that going to be? Some of the early experiments are two-way Next year in Orlando, there will be two-way data link uh, experiments uh, uplinking weather information. It doesn't necessarily have to be funneled through the aircraft situation display system, but can be done directly via data link. And it doesn't necessarily have to go via satellite. It could be a a line of sight uh, VHF data link, for example. But the information, if it can be put in a digital form in a computer, can be put through some communications medium if the aircraft has a data link capability and some means of displaying it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and however this is done, if we get go one way or another, we're not limiting ourselves? No, sir. The data link, the, the whole uh, sequence on the data link deployment is uh, to focus on those services that our uh, aircraft and pilots want first. Uh, some of the early data link applications right now are clearance delivery, uh, the air ATIS information, or the airport terminal information service, and weather information as we're able to uh, do that. Is that, do you have anything else you want to show us on here? One other item I'd like to show is something we call monitor alert. And basically this is a piece of software that senses or determines the number of aircraft into the future <coughs> in a given piece of airspace that we call a sector. If the, if the parameter for that sector is going to be violated as much as 20 minutes and out to literally 12 hours if you chose to, but 20 minutes is where we normally operate, what will happen is your screen will show as it does there with the yellow hash marks. And, all the red and, and obviously the yellow is for the lesser condition versus the red is for something more more stronger in terms of that. This is uh, uh, in the immediate area of the Philadelphia but, but now this And this goes to the people that are in the traffic management? That's correct. Not, not to the controllers? No. And why wouldn't you give this to the controllers, too? Well, first of all is the degree of accuracy is not the same as the radar. Okay, well, say if we got to, uh, to the point where this is real time yeah. and we had it up to speed so it was within a second. Would you not want to give this to the controllers? I would assume if we could get to that kind of technology, we would probably integrate 
the old and the new both. At this particular point in time, we don't have a project underway to do that, though. You don't? No. Just to get down to uh, one-minute updates, and then we'll pursue it after that. Now, the, the situation there is the radar system provides the controller with the depth of knowledge that he needs in order to execute his primary function. These are augment tools and ordinarily are put at supervisory positions or traffic management positions. This is as long as we keep the system where the controller is in charge of everything. I mean, if we're, and if we're going to go to some other, uh, you know, paradigm. Uh, exactly. Yeah, the issue really is, is that I don't think anyone in our group particularly takes any disagreement with the concept of free flight. As a matter of fact, we've been in a modified version of that for some number of years. The issue is the technology and how to go about it. And we have started some dialogue with the airlines and the Air Transport Association to do so. This is a bar chart on the bottom, which gives you specific information in 15-minute increments about those saturated areas and when the number and what number of aircraft will be there and kind of what time frame. Again, this is something you wouldn't want a controller to be involved in while he's simultaneously controlling airplanes. Okay. And this takes into consideration then the speed of the airplane and all that sort of thing. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does trajectory forward. We can go out to as much as 12, 12 hours in the future. However, like I said, our, our experience has been at 20 minutes, there's so much change going on in the system that going out that far really is a questionable issue. See the number two Uh Thank you uh, very much for uh, for that. Um, maybe you want to put that monitor down on the ground again so we get it out of the way. Um, set it on the floor, probably. And the lights can come in again. Huh? Yeah. If the TV people, if you want to put your lights back on. Uh, uh, is that... Uh, Yes, sir. Okay. I, I guess my question is, uh, are you um, seriously looking at this issue of, of giving up a system where the controllers are in charge of everything and, and putting them in, in some other capacity and making this change of, um, of um, mind frame about how we do this? Is that being looked at seriously, or is it? are you not in favor of that, or where are you at? Okay. I can assure you that it's being looked at seriously, sir. Uh, uh, we see it as an evolving process, one that goes through uh, the system as it used to be, where we are today, more participatory separation. I think we can give you another example where uh, we've started using TCAS uh, in participation with the pilots out over the ocean where we have no radar coverage. Uh, we've done some trials with United Airlines, Delta Airlines, it's proven to be quite effective where we uh, participate with the pilots in, in climbing, descending aircraft in those environments. Uh, and I see it doing nothing but evolving to a more participatory process uh, to where it settles into an end state. Uh, but in all of the dialogue I've heard in the, your, uh, the way you refer to this, I think it's clear that, you, that your position is that you guys, the FAA, the controllers are in charge, <laughs> and you're going to participate, uh, you know, and, and I think that that, you know, if, if we stay in that mind frame, you know, then the whole thing gets limited by the amount of time and the, and the, what the controllers can do. Uh, so is that just, am I not right about uh, what I'm hearing there? I hope that that's not what you're hearing. I hope that what you're hearing from us is one that, that, uh, is weighing very, very heavily our commitment to the safety of the system. When we move in the direction of, of changing the system as dramatically as we're talking about changing the system, we want to be very deliberate, very go about it in a very cautious, uh, very well-studied manner to change the system. I, I hope that you're not hearing any reluctance on our part to move away from a philosophy that we've had for years into a new philosophy, to a new concept, because I don't believe that exists, sir. I think the, uh, the willingness to move is there. The uh, desire to make sure that we maintain the levels of safety 
is is a commitment that we take very highly. Is that why you're restricting the the use of the national route program because you're concerned about safety? You're moving slow. Is that why you're doing that? Yes, sir. That was the uh, that's uh, the exact reason. We started with uh, very few city pairs uh, at at higher altitudes. We've lowered the uh, altitude, increased the numbers of city pairs uh, that that. Uh, user preferred trajectories are, are available on now up to 104 as of July the 8th and we're looking now at whether we should continue to lower the altitude or should shorten the distance between the city pairs to something less than 1500 miles to increase use of this program. Uh, our commitment is to continue to expand this program as we move toward user preferred trajectories uh, but we want to make sure we know what the impact is as we do this. How do you, uh, I, uh, my sense is that uh, ATA and others think that you're moving too slow and that you're being too cautious. Uh, uh, how do you respond to that? I understand their concern. Uh, I, I would hope that they understand our, our wanting to be very deliberate and being uh, uh, very, uh, the term cautious, I guess, is the right term for me to use as we do this to make sure that we're not having an impact on, on the system and on the safety of the system. Uh, certainly would like to be able to more nearly meet their expectations in this area and we'll work very hard to do that. Does the FAA have any stated policy to the, on the extent of that you will share this surveillance data with, with uh, users as it's collected? Do you have any official policy or written down? Uh, this data that you have seen, we share that now with the airlines. I believe that uh, we share it with 14 different airlines. Uh, they use it in their operations for flight planning and uh, we have daily, daily communications with them where we discuss this information as we're both looking at the same display. Uh, is that, is there a policy written down or is this something that's developed on a case-by-case -case basis or how does that we work? We have 11 uh, air carrier and parcel carriers who currently have the aircraft situation display in their facility. And they've signed a contract? And they've signed a letter of agreement with us on how we would use it and what the vehicle is and what the data is. There are how does somebody go about getting one of these letters of agreement? Just come uh, and talk to you or? Uh, yes. Uh, are, can people other than airlines have access to I was just going to say, let, let me make one point. The, the data that we provide to the airlines is not total what you see here on the display. We do limit and restrict military air, aircraft, military operations, and law enforcement kind of support operations. Not on there. That are not on there, but they are on the air traffic control unit display. Can, can non-airlines get access to this? At this point, we have not given it to non-airlines. We've had discussions with people who run bus services, who run limousine services, and those types of, uh, of ancillary uh, uh, businesses that would, I guess, benefit from knowing uh, what the position of an aircraft is and landing times and those types of things. But to this point, we have limited it to uh, aviation. So any, anybody in aviation can sign one of these agreements? Well, they can, but there's also an investment for them in terms of either the hardware or leasing time on a machine. So it's not it's not a yeah, freebie type. Right, but I mean, if they're willing to do that, they can have access to it. Yes, sir. Um, Gisella from Shashays, do you have any? Yeah, I I uh, apologize. I had to leave for a minute, but uh, you know, one of the things that that I'm torn with uh, is is that. It, in the other panel, it makes so much sense from what you hear from the industry to go f towards the, the pre-flight. And then I also sympathize with the FAA in wanting to do it, but do it on a gradual basis so that you, you uh, are able to do it in a, in a safe way. And then seeing some of the things on the computer here in the, in before us um, in terms of the density, uh, is there a way that you can somehow compromise where you, not compromise safety, but compromise uh, in terms of coming to grips with a, a logical phase in, uh, and, and do you do it geographically or do you do it by time of day or, uh, I mean, have you thought about, I mean, if, if in fact you're, you're in agreement with the new technology, uh, but you only want to do it in a way that, that, is, that provides safe access to air travel, um, 
have you looked at next step and how you're going to be able to do this, or are you just going to do it on a day by day basis? I mean, what is the plan? Maybe you've already answered it. But. No, sir, I don't think I've answered it. Uh, first of all, I think it will be very much a, a phased in uh, process. I don't think that we would agree that all of the technology that's needed is available today to do this. It, uh, it's a very complex set of technologies, one of which we have had in development for almost 11 years and uh, is still a couple of three years away from coming to fruition, one that probes for conflict and offers the controllers resolutions. Uh, you heard this morning that uh, there is belief that uh, the technology is available and we are exploring with those individuals uh, uh, the technology that they're discussing. We in air traffic right now are in the process of, of developing and will be in full cooperation with the users of the system a service plan that allows us to sit down with the people who use the system and develop a plan for phasing these in. This was started about three months ago, probably another three to five months in development. But at that time, we should have, if you will, a contract with the users of the system that says, given the development of these technologies, these are the services, this is the way you can expect the system to operate in this time frame. This will allow us to proceed with the development of the procedures and policies that we need to support the system as well as allow the airlines to equip in a very cost efficient way to, to obtain these services. And rough, uh, and that makes sense to me at least, uh, and just wondering if, uh, what is the general, I mean, if you had to come up with a date, you're talking five years, 10 years, 20 years? To, for, for, for full implementation of right. free flight, th please understand that this is a guess. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would guess that a substantial portion of the benefits that, that will be derived from this concept will be available in the 8 to 12 year time frame. Full implementation may be as much as 15 to 20 years away. Mm -hmm. And then I suppose if you if you need to have all of the technology that needs to that you need to in order to make that happen, uh, you ha you, f you feel better about getting that done than 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 the advanced automation system. Well, a, m a major portion of the technologies that we need to accomplish the predominant part of free flight have been in development for several years. Mm -hmm. They were, were put into development as, a, as an integral part of the advanced automation system, as an ancillary part of the advanced automation system. So they're well underway as far as development. The eventual outcome of the advanced automation sy system certainly plays a part in this, but they're not totally dependent on the advanced automation system as we knew it. What w you say, uh, uh, it's quite a few years out, assuming certain things take place. Uh, what would you say would accelerate that uh, new technology? Most of the t most of the hardware type technology, or all of the hardware te type technology, is available to us today, dependent upon how the the advanced automation system eventually works out. The process that we're going through now is development uh, that allows us to use other technologies that are available in the marketplace, such as data link, uh, such as the ability to use automatic dependent surveillance to replace radar display. Uh, types of, it's, it's a matter of adapting it to the use of the air traffic control system, developing some very complex uh, software applications that will give us the conflict probes and resolutions uh, uh, that we need to have free flight in, in the en route environment. We're well on the way. Uh, you heard a gentleman this morning talk about uh, the CTAS, the uh, spacing tools that will be used. Those are in development. Those are still in prototype, but we're very hopeful. They're very promising. We have uh, software in development now, converging runway displays that will allow us to, to optimize the use of uh, approaches to converging runways. This has been uh, uh, installed and implemented in a couple of locations. We have uh, technology being developed at 
that will allow us not only to increase the acceptance rate, acceptance rate of airports during poor weather, but to allow for better ground movement of aircraft during poor weather. As the chairman in his, uh, in his, with his pilot uh, experience would tell you that uh, in some of the lowest weather conditions, it becomes not only important for an aircraft to be land, to be able to land with zero, zero visibility, it then becomes a problem to get that aircraft to the gate. And we're developing some technologies now that will help us with that. It, we have an awful lot of activity going on in this area, n any one of which plays a role in being able to provide the Air Transport Association and other users of the system with the, with the end state that they desire. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chase, do you? I, I just, because uh, we do have bells, and, uh, and I know we'd like to finish up, but, but the basic message <laughs> coming through loud and clear is the industry wants uh, free flight. It's costing them a bundle. They want it as soon as possible. And the message I'm getting from the FAA is that you're, you're moving along, but you don't really have a timetable. You don't really have a sense of, of where, candidly, you haven't said it this way, but this is the feeling I'm getting. You don't have a sense of, of how quickly you can get there and how you're going to get there, actually. And, or even agreement on what it will take to get there. You have, you know, and that's the message I'm getting, which is, uh, and it's not money, I think. It's just the, really the approach that the FAA is following. I'm just wondering if there's, I'd love to know what the solution to this is because I don't, I don't like what I see. I think you're, you're correct in your perception that uh, we do lack complete agreement, but that, those are some things that we haven't sat down and talked about. I think it's important that we agree on the concept that we agree that uh, we'll move as rapidly as possible, technology and procedures allowing, and that's a commitment that I'll make to you today. It's not a matter of money. Uh, there are some areas that I would assure you that we do not know how we're going to accomplish those at the present time, but I'm confident that uh, given the, the will to do that and the technology that's available to us today, that as those uh, difficulties arise, that we'll be able to overcome them. I, I cannot assure you that I, I know when exactly we can do that, other than to commit to you and the users of the system mm -hmm. that we'll work very diligently and do this as rapidly as we can. I, get, I, I guess it raises the question of, um, of why you can't. And um, let me just ask you this. Uh, have you involved the carriers in this pro uh, process in a very active way? Or you, you kind of insulated them from this process? I think the carriers have been involved in any number of, of system development. We have uh, total involvement of the air carriers and other users of the system in developing uses uh, for the satellite system, for, for yes. GPS, for example. Free flight, per se, is a relatively new concept that has been introduced over the last three to four months. Well, given the, the, the numbers that are involved, the claim on the carrier's part of $3.5 billion a year, it seems to me there's got to be a tremendous incentive to, to deal with this. And, and uh, uh, I don't know, it, it seems to me that, that I don't see the energy, uh, even in your description, of, of, of what it will take to get us there. I mean, I, I know you have the goodwill to do it. I just don't know if it's going to happen. And, I, and it seems to me that this is an extraordinarily important hearing to, to introduce this problem to us because I frankly haven't been aware of it. And uh, uh, maybe we can help provide some energy. Well, if, if I could, I'd like – I'm sorry we can't portray the energy. We, mm -hmm. we work with the carriers very closely. Yeah. We try to optimize their operation. Aside from our safety uh, obligation, our next obligation is to an efficient system uh, we empathize with them a great deal and work with them as, as, as much as we possibly can to, to make the system as efficient could, as we do can. You, do you think it's possible that, that we would have carriers that could come to us and tell us that uh, that's in fact the case? In other words, you're telling us what you, you are doing with the carriers, but do we have any testimony that the carriers feel that we're doing, uh, that there is this kind of relationship? Uh, I would say that uh, they give it mixed uh, Marks <laughs> at best. See the one of the I think you know I, I have to tell you that eight to twelve years is not acceptable. Yeah. I mean it, that is crazy. There is no reason that we need to wait eight to twelve years to get this done. I you know, Mr. Chairman, I that was I have anything to say about it. It is not going to take eight to twelve years. You know. 
you know, and it, it seems to me that we have a built-in disincentive for a carrier to be critical of the FAA. I mean, basically, uh, you run the system, but you have extraordinary control over the carriers. And it, it, um, my sense is that the carriers are not pleased at all, aside from what the pilots have said as well. Mr. Chairman, the 8 to 12 years uh, was, was a best guess as when we will we'll have a substantial amount of this. I, there will well, be incremental improvement. I think I it's... Underst I understand that. And I don't think it's going to take 8 to 12 years. I mean, I, I, I think that's just crazy. Uh, a couple things I'd like, and we'll, uh, we'll, when we go to vote, we'll let you go, and then we have one more panel. But uh, uh, when will the FEA's report on Mr. Watt's program testing free flight be available? And when will it, and will it have recommendations? Mr. Watts got a program. Uh, ski plan. Ski plan. Have you looked at that? Uh, I, the first time and only time I've seen uh, Mr. Watts uh, any reference to his program was in the uh, document that was prepared by Mr. Boyd and Mr. Beata on free flight, published in June of this year. Uh, Are you looking at that? We will look at that. No, sir, we're not at this time. Well, I would like you to, when you can, get a chance to look at that, if you'd respond to me, you know, when, when uh, you, you know, any report that you have would be available and whether it would have recommendations. And I also, do you agree with Mr. Watts and the ASRC's statement that uh, Mr. Watts' program shows that, that their version of free flight is valid? Or haven't you looked at it enough? I have not looked at his program, so I could not comment on that, sir. When will you be able to? As soon as we can get a copy of his program, we'll be happy to start looking at it. I'll ask Mr. Planzer to uh, take a look at it along with Mr. Hurley, and uh, we should be able to get back to you within 30 days. Okay, and, uh, uh, I would appreciate that. And uh, just, you know, for, for your information, there are carriers telling us that the FAA will not allow them to participate in this. And it's, some of them are telling us that. So they're, they're, they're getting the message or feeling that they're not being included in this as much as they would like. So take that for whatever it's worth. I um, appreciate very much you being with us today. Uh, and we, uh, as you can probably tell, we'll be communicating with you as, on this. And, uh, and I do want to say that, that I really think that in the area of the GPS landings and that, you, you really have done an excellent job over there. And I commend the administrator and for taking a hold of that moving. And now we need to get focused on some of this other stuff and get that moving as well as we got GPS moving. So, Thank, thank you, you very much, sir. Uh, we will uh, recess briefly and then we'll call the last panel uh, as soon as we get back from voting. subcommittee uh, I've got a meeting with the Secretary of Agriculture so I'm gonna have to be done by 1 15 so uh, we should make that without any problem I got it